Okay, we are live now. Okay, we can start? Yes, we are live. Okay. Dr. Said, please. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. On behalf of Join Football Association and the Sheikh Rashid Mahmoud Bin President of the UAE UK, and on behalf of the Medical Committee of the UAE UK, Join Football International, and on behalf of the Center, I would like to welcome you this uh, event where we discuss about uh, ACL and young people. Uh, so, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much, Dr. Saeed Aftani. Uh, uh, first of all, once again, I would like to thank our friends from all over the world who are attending this webinar. We, as the FIFA Medical Center of Excellence, are proud to organize this event with our strategic partner, the UAA Football Association. And on behalf of His Excellency Sami al Gemzi, our chairman, I would like to thank our eminent speakers today. They are all well-respected and recognized experts, both nationally and internationally. Thus, I am confident that this webinar will be a great experience for all. Now, I'd like to leave the floor for Dr. Daryl, who will present our first speaker. Thank you so much, uh, Saeed and Murad. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here uh, today. Um, I appreciate the United Arab Emirates Football Association for putting on this great webinar, and obviously the FIFA Medical Center of Excellence in Dubai. So our first speaker will be Saeed al Tiani, and he's a consultant for orthopedic and traumatology uh, for the orthopedic arthroscopy and sports medicine and joint reconstruction. He is the president of the Emirates Orthopedic Society and chairperson for the UAE AO chapter. So, Dr. Sa uh, Dr. Saeed Al Thani, go ahead and uh, give the first presentation. Okay, so it's ACL reconstruction with uh, the color BTG uh, graph, and the question is why we do it. Uh, so, the level objective of this presentation. To talk about why the color film graph is my choice. And we we'll talk about selection of graph to gain the stability, returning to score, and avoiding complications. Improving the graph harvesting and avoiding inferior use. And it's a little bit We talk about uh, BTD, we look at uh, uh, how we can take it from uh, the one on the left to the right. But there is no term is L to reconstruction. As we know, it is one of the most common orthopedic procedures that perform and restore knee stability in the patient to turn to sport. In the long term, it includes risk of chondral and ascal damage in the external knees and, uh, as we say, the graph choices intervention. So, how we Judge the success of ACL. Success of ACL, in my view, will require a good graph and high strength with good fixation or any fixation and stability. Uh, return to pre injury level, this is very important for young athletes and especially professionals, and it's less complications. So, in 2021, what is the gold standard when we talk about? Of choice. So we will go over this gold standard of draft choice. So if we look at this paper by Anderson in 2001, where they did a retrospective randomized study of three years follow comparing a different group with a patient, 35 patients with DTD, uh, 33 patients with the uh, uh, CMT uh, autograph. And uh, the middle group, which was a typical with the CMT and the uh, IT band extra uh, procedure. 
They find that uh, that uh, ATP graft had a higher incident of normal result compared with the other two. So from that point, uh, they conclude that the uh, ATP autograft is more successful. And this is another paper recently. Uh, and focus in the ten to bear regularly. Sorry, presentation is so cool. So they conclude that uh, hamstring uh, from the standard of 36 a ragged player to find that there is high incident of graft failure in younger players, uh, especially with uh, hamstring graft. And they advise against going for a uh, hamstring graft in young active population and for the middle to fail. Then we have to assess uh, literature for stability. And when we go to stability, after LCR reconstruction, we look at the bowel and we can join us for in 2009. We have data of 423 patients uh, that shows that improved stability with PTB will compare with hamster. Another paper in 2011. By Nick McTeddy from Canada in the Cochrane collection and viewing the data of 1,600 patients, which shows that BTB is improved stability uh, with the, uh, the, the, the increase of the and eating, or that's one of the side effects of the BTB uh, that's noticed of the complications. But the stability is higher with BTB. Another paper uh, in 2012 by uh, Lee uh, shows 738 patients. Also shows that uh, hamstring graft is a failure to be to be in restoring immune joint stability. Again, in 2015, there was uh, 183 patients whose relative life outcome was not different, but the it is a significantly lower side to side difference on static stability measures. So you can see that GPD is given more stability here. Then the other factor for athlete is prepared to play. If we start with the uh, in 2001 analysis, it shows that with the BTB uh, tend to bring injury activity is a few percent greater chance as compared to semi Another paper from 2003 by Teller, a 57 patient at three years for up to living at a higher incident, uh, but we're talking about 88% versus 68% of the hamstring from the group who took the level one to two activity at least, meaning that this higher percentage of people will be to, be to go back to support the higher level of support. Again, in 2015, Zai with the analysis uh, study shows 900 patients. Again, BTB shows a spiral resuming the patient of stability and return to higher level of activity. Meeting. Uh, and is an issue with the uh, BTB, but if we look after the incision and take care of it, we can revise it. As Rias shows here, that two incision BTB graft with the femoral and the tail, but to the team on, minimize the length of the scar and reduce any type of defect which can put this factor for pain while moving. Uh, 
But failure never factor. It's an interest with drug failure, with the hamstring, as we call it. This is a five year fallout from and then the region associated uh, with the registry of uh, 12,600 of the primary ACL or 75, with 3,400 PT and 9,000 uh, hamstring. Again, here, uh, the, the hazard ratio for the region was 2.3, with the increase was to failure with the hamstring as conducted. Then we go to another paper from John Robert Surgeon uh, by me, an Asia Reconcil Practice Pattern in NFL and NCAA for the fourteen position. Again, it shows that 86% of the survey physician was BTB autograph as their draft of choice. And communication with BTB autograph mostly revolving around the activity of the overall side of activity. And the early biological graph hearing the autograph to be supersede the rest of the activity. That's the conclusion from the study. Uh, again, when we talk, we talk about the complication. Complication, I think it's, uh, it is overall great. This is a student for this, not significant. Uh, a lot of it to do with the material maintain, um, to do with the, with the Tunnel uh, position in the graph fixation in the graph site. Um, again, this is uh, what first put there in 2009 uh, to get a real communication to say it to be integrated to enable the standard for ACI reconstruction for a multitude of reasons, including low failure rate and increased cost and mm -hmm. others. So, we took a look at the beach that is more stable. In higher return of sport, better for knee stability, less failure rate, and better risk of sorry, But there is a risk of better knee pain to move away and optimal route for young and high demand athletes. I think it's just a good thing. Thank you. So, this is during my current surgical undergrad with more. Um, Athlete, a competitive athlete, I will go for the Rogers PTD. When I'm ordering for the man creation of athletes, I will go for the Rogers Symmetry. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Altani. The, the next talk that we're going to have is uh, by Patrick Young. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Young is a believer in orthopedic sports medicine. He's currently the chairman of the Department of Orthopedics and Traumatology, as well as serving as the chairman or president of several prominent and local international organizations focused on orthopedic sports medicine and arthroscopic procedures. So Dr. Young is going to be talking about ACL reconstruction with soft tissue autograft, including hamstring. Thank you very much, Dr. Young. Hi, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah, so can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Good. So I proceed, right? Thanks very much. First of all, my good friends, uh, Murat, uh, for inviting me to join this very uh, uh, good conference uh, regarding uh, ACL surgery. So I'm asked to talk something about my uh, practice in ACL. So essentially, I'm using hamstring graft, right? So I have no uh, financial disclosure. I just want to disclose that I'm the team doctors of the Hong Kong champion team, Kichi. Uh, so indeed, uh, they just uh, participated the first group match of Asian Champions League yesterday in Thai and won the first match. And our striker, Dejan uh scored one goal, and now he is the record holder of the Asian Champions League uh, all over the history. For it goes uh, over the years, right? Um, that's my little disclosure. <laughs> okay. So my journey with ACL started essentially about 30 years ago, since I torn my own ACL, right? At that time, I received a surgery from one of my mentors, Professor K.M. Chen, uh, 30 years ago with BBB Graph. Um, I'm still playing, right? It works well, right? Well, today I'm going to talk a little bit about the followings. Um, first of all, let's talk about the graph options. Why I choose hamstring, right? Well, uh, there are so many studies talking about the difference between like BBB versus hamstring. Now, for stability, essentially non-term level one and level two studies already shows that there's no difference between the two in terms of the stability of the graph. How about the muscle strength deficit after harvesting the graph? Yes, uh, quite a number of studies shows that, well, there is a significant deficit of the hamstring muscle strength 
after you harvest the hamstring tendon. But however, in a long-term studies, people shows that there is essentially no difference between uh, using uh, 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 PVP versus hamstring graft if we talk about the strength of the hamstring in the long term, right? That means that you can compensate your knee fractions with uh, uh, rehabilitations, right? How about pain? Indeed, more and more studies show that well, PVP graft is actually having more donor site mobility in terms of the pain uh, in the front part of the knee, while hamstring essentially less this kind of mobility symptoms, right? Functional outcome, no difference between the two in the long term. So, how about finally return to play? Again, no difference between the two, PVP versus hamstring. So, ladies and gentlemen, because of all this, no difference in the function, no difference in the graph rupture rate, and so on. So, I do think the hamstring autograph works well, as like in PVP graph, and, but, uh, but it has less donor site mobility. So, that's why I choose hamstring graph. Right? So, how you do it, right? Well, essentially, this is a, a survey among, I just want to show you a survey among the Asian knee apostrophe think tank, which is under the APCAS group. 18 knee surgeons from, from eight countries sitting together inside a room and talk about ACL, right? So we, this is like a survey among these 18 surgeons, right? Majority of them are using hamstring autograph. So this is like the preference amongst a lot of Asian surgeons. That's number one. Regarding how to do it, right? Uh, in the historically, People start to do ACL and talk about this isometric concept. I won't elaborate too much on this because probably you know about it. This is like you know this. We talk a lot about isometric concept, but then people think about is it is it really an isometric point for ACL? And if it is plays an isometric point, is it going to work very well, or if there is any other better options? And people also use this clock based concept for years. Talk about like two o'clock, ten o'clock position, and so on. But with time slowly evolving over the past like 10, 15 years, people change from this isometric crop face concept to more anatomical concept. That means that we are doing the ACL according to its original anatomy at the femoral side and, and also the tibial side. The principal group led by Freddie um, talk about this uh, only landmarks, including the lateral bifurcate ridge and the lateral intercondyle ridge, which distinguish the anatomical and anterior middle and the postural bundle of the ACL. So we call this kind of insertional side surgery. But with time, people think that you cannot blindly reconstruct the knee with light tool bundle. Different people have different individualized ACL anatomy. So that's why with time, people are talking about individualized anatomical ACL reconstruction according to the true anatomy of individuals. And that's what I'm doing. I'll just quickly show you what I've been doing, right? Now this is like a case of ACL torn. You see, you see that the stump is still there. You can see the femoral footprint and the and the tibial footprint, right? Right. So with this footprint in situ, you can mark it, right? Where is the femoral insertions? And then I simply use like a bullet, right, over there to target at it, and then do my guide pin, right? So this is how I mark my femoral insertion, which is exactly where the stump is, right? And then you pass your guide in, you rim up with an uh, endoverter rimmer, which I use the endoverter for proximal fixation, you measure it, and then you rim it up to the size, exactly the size of the graph, which I will talk about this, how to prepare the graph. Okay, and then I preserve the stump, right? And with the stump, I do it in a guide wire, and then later on, I rim it up to the size of the diameter of the graph, right? So this is how it looks like. Uh, after all, I preserve the uh, stump, and the, the, the ACL graph exactly is inside the stump, right? Now, I use a hamstring autograph using gracilis and semi tendinosis. Seldomly, I can use just one tendon. I use both tendons, and at least I require 8 millimeter in diameter, which a lot of evidence papers show that uh, you need a sizable graph, right? If it can be done in a quadruple strand, fine. If not, we, we triple the semi T graph and make it into a five strand graph, and approximately I fix it with an endo button, right? Well, today, um, I received a, a, a friend from Brazil. He showed us this kind of preparation of the hamstring graph, which they use, they preserve the muscle and prepare into a volumetric graph, with more sizable graph, and also induce some regenerations of the stem cells around there. I think it's a good option. I have no experience in using this, but I just want to call this paper, which is just published in OJSM. So how about putting in the graph, how do you fix this? As I mentioned, proximally, I fix it with an endo button, and this story I fix it with a bow screws at the longest graph length with the knee in a reduced position but without excessive posterior jaw. This is very, very important. People tend to 
push the knee posteriorly and try to maximize the tension of the bra. But this can be dangerous because you create too much high tension of the bra and that will increase the patrofermal joint pressure and increase patrofermal joint practice. We published our findings in the Journal of Orthopedic Translation last year about this. So we just optimally reduce the knee in the, into the optimal position without excessive posterior joint will be the best outcome. This is how, what I mentioned, right? I look at the graph, look at the graph, and then like this, press and extend the knee to see if there's moving. If it's moving, then I choose the longest length positions and fix it with the table screw. Right? So finally, I just want to show you that indeed this is not just my preference, it's a consensus among a lot of Asian surgeons, right? Well, this is the consensus that we made in 2019, right? Essentially, the majority of the people are doing anatomical single bundle, that means respecting the anatomy. Less and less people are doing double bundle, and very seldom many people are doing selective, double, uh, selective bundle reconstructions. So, and indeed, I present all this finding in the Pittsburgh Pampers PCL consensus meeting with the Pittsburgh group and, and surgeons all around the world. You may recognize some of the familiar face. So, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to summarize my way of ACL reconstructions. Hamstring autograph, at least 8 millimeter in diameter, individualized anatomical ACL reconstructions, stump perforations, and no over tensioning of the graph. That means that we have to respect the nature. Well, can we return to play with this kind of practice? This is my practice over the last 10 years, right? And this, I just want to show you this World Cup qualifying game between Hong Kong, 7 million of people, versus China, 1.5 billion of people. And then in this game, we draw 0 to 0. And in this game, out of the 11 uh, regular players of Hong Kong, they, 5 of them received ACL reconstruction, and they returned to play quite well, right? So my final comment is that we have to respect the anatomy, respect the very original nature of the human being. Once again, I would like to thank my friend Brody for inviting me. We have a good time in Dubai uh, two years back. I look forward to seeing all of you soon. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Young. What a great presentation on hamstrings. So next, we're actually going to make a little bit of change in the schedule. We're going to go to uh, Dr. Ramon Cugat of Barcelona, where he's going to talk about a summary of the most adequate treatment for ACL. So Dr. Kudat is the pres president of uh, the uh, Medical Society, member of the medical staff of the Catalan Soccer Delegations Health Insurance Company under the so Spanish Soccer Federation. And he's the director of the Institute Kugat, the Center for Orthopedic Surgery and Traumatology, and a co-director of the Orthopedic Surgical Department and Hospital in Barcelona. So we appreciate Dr. Kugat uh, giving us this lecture. Thank you. everybody. Thank you for this kind of invitation to Dr. Mahashimi, Dr. Osbal, Dr. Rayleigh, and Dr. Almutama. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to speak about the uh, ACL uh, because I think it's a, a good part of the problems uh, in the soccer players. And here is our disclosure. And here you can see uh, there is a multidisciplinary group as of doctors, uh, veterinarians, and research, communication, nursing, and remuneration department. This year, I think everybody knows a lot of things about ACL. You can see these pictures of uh, Dr. Paolo Bolano, who passed away, and why this picture of Dr. Grekov in Russia? Because he was the first to do surgery in 1930, young Grekov in St. Petersburg, operated ACL and ACL surgery. And here, on the left, you can see the anatomy, the two fascicles, antimedial, uh, is more to prevent the anteromedial posterior displacement. The anteromedial bundle and the postural uh, was more in the special protection. <coughs> the injury of mechanism you can see here this player is so common that flex, valgus, and um, internal rotation of the fibula, the fibula external in the in the tibia, 
and plus anterior tibial translation. You can see this video is very old, it's maybe a little more than 20 years. This player, uh, okay, Miguel Angel Benitez, he had a problem, big problem in the knee. Anterior cruciate ligament, posterior cruciate ligament, was the dislocation? Fracture, fracture of the lateral femoral plateau, abortion of the two meniscus, and uh, rupture of the patella tendon, etc., etc. And here you can see uh, the woman, this girl, play the national team, rupture, medial lateral ligament, and anterior cruciate ligament. We have seen a review of the anatomy, the mechanism of the injury, and what happened in the uh, problem happened the osteoarthritis, as you can see. Why? Because content, uh, the pressure in the metafemoral condom and lateral femoral condom is the pressure of the ligaments. And uh, when we have uh, an injury of the anterior ligament, at 10 years, 50% of the patients uh, suffer uh, osteoarthritis. And 80% when it's a combined anterior ligament plus the meniscus. Here, we're going to make a revision of the epidemiology and the uh, ischial injury. Uh, 125,251 injuries in the Football Federation in Barcelona, in Catalonia. And that is the model of the Football Federation. You can see in these uh, eight, year, eight seasons, 196,811 injuries has been treated in the Mutual of Footballistas, is the Spanish Federation of Football. And Antiochus and Ligament Rogers, 6,400. Later, when we have the injury, the diagnosis is a medical history, drone, anterior, lagman, and pivot shift test, then the MRI, as you can see here in this picture, and then the general row you can see here. That is the line of the uh, healthy knee, and that is pathology. Normally, more than 2.5, 134 newtons, we can say the mm, ligament is not good function. And that's the tendon we are using. We are using patella tendon. And just uh, some pictures to see how is the okay, drilling in the real turtle, drilling in the patella. So, to motion the tubercle of the alts. And here, remove it. Now we cut uh, this piece of bone 20, 25 millimeters longitude and 9, 10 millimeters approximately wide and deeper 5, 6 millimeters. See, I'm starting with the score. We need to avoid uh, great uh, fracture of the <laughs> And here, just uh, this uh, video. We make a revision, that's the anterior medial portal being for water. We run it inside and join to see all the compartments. We can the lateral data, all, and then we touch with the hood with this uh, ligament, was diagnosis of the rupture. Now we are cleaning and preparing for to do the first of all the posterior tunnel in the femur. Now, first of all, I'm sorry, is the tunnel in the tibia. Right, everybody knows. Uh, we try to use the more medial and little, little posterior. 
the same line of the mode of the lateral meniscus. And here you can see that is the uh, accessory anteromedial portal with the drill, and down you can see is the just one uh, tunnel from tibia, that is from tibia to femur. Now, we're using this uh, thread and the flexor extension to see how is the tension uh, to avoid uh, uh, more uh, tension in extension or inflection. That is the real now in the femur. You can see, and we increase, we start with five millimeters approximately, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten is the most common nine or ten. And we are tensioning the thread in flexion extension to see how is the isometry in the graph for the future. Now we are using this expanding. That is very good when the uh, bone is uh, lower density. But in this case, in sarcophagus, we will use a drill, not only the expansion, it was diagnosed by uh, and created by Lanny Johnson from East Lansing, Michigan. We are cleaning. And you can see, posterior wall. Now, the thread pulled from the femur pass inside the joint. And normally, we have the reactions of the bone uh, row in the femur. And here's in the tibia. We perform flexion extension to see the graph is not possible not necessary to remove one millimeter. Now, superior in the area that is the cancerous bone in the uh, piece of bone in the, in the femur, we pass. Okay, now we put at the same level of the bone in the femur, we pull the glass, and then we insert the screw. Finally, we try to test if it's too tight or no, but we need to have a good movement from flexion to extension. And here, uh, everybody knows the uh, maternity pain has been uh, spoken more about the patellar tendon is more anterior pain than the other graph. Okay, the idea was to release, to decrease this anterior knee pain using PRP in the donor side in the patella and the tendon, as you can see in these pictures, and finally inside the knee joint. The maturation, everybody knows, and we perform uh, some studies to demonstrate the PRP. Uh, when we infiltrate an accelerate link in the anterior uh, ligament. As you can see here, at seven weeks and 40 weeks, how is the evolution? And when we have uh, one anterior ligament with excessive anterolateral instability, we are using linear graph addition for this anterolateral instability. The look at it's only 1,822 ACLs injuries, and there are 58 cases we need to create this until uh, weekly eight, and this uh, reinforce 
as uh, explained in Linnea many years ago, in the last century. Another kind of thing, when we have this HDL, is not destroyed, and it's just a portion from the femur, we perform this suture and reattach because it's impossible to get the insertion area. It's not so common, but in some cases we can see. Instead of reconstruction, the idea is to encourage in the same plane of this insertion. And then you can see we touch, it's, it's fine. And then biology. Biology with the new factors help very much to increase healing the graph. As in the future, or when it's microsexual, I can tell you. Asian rupture in childs, an open, open crisis. You can see in this study, 1,822 ACLs, 68 cases in a young, normally they start at 8 years, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. In these cases, the crisis is open, and we need to take care because that is not so easy to treat these cases. We need to avoid to touch the physis only in the tibia. We pass with the threads attached with a device in the anterior part of the anterior part of the tibia. And here you can see the graph. I think we talked about nothing. Uh, all the mechanism of injury and surgery, diagnosis and surgery. But the surgery, I think, is important, but it's crucial rehabilitation. And here we describe these phases four. The first one is restore the core range of motion in key muscle exercise. First of all, hamstrings and secondary quads. That start among one week after the surgery. In the phase two, we progress maximum muscle exercise and start outdoors exercises. And the stress to uh, is in the field exercise. And number four is the turn to play. After indoor rehabilitation and physical therapy, we do outdoor rehabilitation. Work on an even ground, mountain, sun, and feel in the world. Continuous run, changes direction, and changes speed. Jumps and jumps, maximum intensity. After this talk, I think it's good to remember some things. That is a take home message. For us, bone and peritoneal bone is the gold standard for male and female. PRP to prevent anterior pain and stimulate intervention. If excessive antelatal instability in ACM rupture, antelatal bone plus Lemer tunic. Anti-recursion partial rupture, reinsertion if it's possible. Anti-recursion human injury with open physis, graph extension of open physis. ACL injury is the beginning of the new degeneration. That is the reason we need to pay attention in biology. 
because biology helps very much to heal many injuries in the professional or amateur soccer players. Thank you very much for, the, for your attention. Thank you and thanks for this kind invitation to be here today in Dubai. Thank you so much, Ramon. Darren, could you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, uh, as we expected, there is a small change in the program. Professor Kiami uh, from La Sorbonne University Hospital, he got an emergency and now, and now, now he's inside the operating room. So we hope that he can be able to, he will be able to join us at the end of this uh, uh, two presentations, Daryl and uh, Paolo Lobo. So uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Daryl Oshbar. He's a nationally renowned orthopedic uh, sports medicine surgeon that serves as managing director and chief of orthopedic surgery for Rothman Orthopedic Institute, Florida. Currently, he serves as the cool chief medical officer of USC baseball, as well as a team physician or orthopedic consultant for the Washington Nationals for U.S. soccer also, professional golf association, and the, the list is very long. Congratulations for that. <laughs> so, I leave you the floor to Darren, please. Thank you uh, so much, Murat. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, what a pleasure to uh, be chairing and part of, uh, part of this meeting. So, I very much appreciate it. And so, this lecture is going to talk a, lot of, a little bit about what happens when everything goes wrong with all the presentations from before. And we don't achieve a successful result ultimately and have a re tear of our ACL graft. And so, this is a realistic uh, consideration of what happens. My presentation just. Can you see this still, Maria? Yes, 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 okay. of course. I apologize, don't know what happened. Okay. No, no, it's okay, but go ahead. Primary ACL reconstruction graft failure is realistic with about 200,000 ACL reconstructions per year and about a five to 10 ACL reconstruction graft failure rate. That leaves about 15,000 revisions uh, per year in the United States alone. And so, to me, there's several different reasons that reconstructions can fail. And so, I think the ultimate, most important component of when an ACL graft fails is identify, identifying why. And there could be a multitude of different reasons why, and I'll name five of them. Number one could be technical error, uh, not in some tunnel placement in insufficient graft material or fixation and graft impingement. Number two can be biological incorporation failure, which Dr. Kugat talked a lot about, arthrofibrosis or insufficient ligamentization. And then the third can be traumatic re-injury. So the patient's just knee is put in a, a bad situation with an overload event and the graft fails, uh, just as the initial ACL reconstruction failed. Number four can be secondary instability patterns. So are there malalignments that weren't necessarily addressed at the first surgery? And certainly that's not necessarily always a failure of the surgeon. Sometimes uh, when you're trying to get, especially a high level athlete back to play, it's very difficult to consider things like osteotomies including varus or valus malalignment or changing the slope to help prevent that when doing it surgery. But really when it comes down to ligament insufficiencies, were those addressed in the proper way as well, including posterior lateral and posterior medial uh, insufficiencies. The other one is meniscus. Uh, this has obviously become a very important topic more recently about preservation of the meniscus and the conformity of the tibiofemoral joint. And so to me, uh, preservation of meniscus is critical to providing constraints in a knee and subsequently putting decreased load on our ACL reconstruction. It's often very difficult to understand the graft failure ideology though, and these four different reasons can be present in, in most patients, and it can be, uh, you can have more than one of them in one specific patient. But the one I'm gonna talk about next, next is very near and dear to my heart, is inadequate, inadequate rehabilitation. To me, sometimes, this is the most common reason I see for ACL reconstruction failure. Um, often time-based or, or criteria-based protocols are, are not really, um, they're not rolled out in the right way to be able to present the patient with a realistic option not to put their knee in another position where the ACL could fail. And so that could be a situation where the graft isn't given time to mature over a course of a nine-month period, or subsequently, the no muscular control and the safe sport specifically the pattern of 18 for the when we look at causes of ACL reconstruction failure, 
Um, you can really see all these different places in the months close to the group that talk about these. Um, we can have traumatic reasons for failure, technical errors, and even biologic. And we right, I'm getting some feedback. Is there uh, somebody who's not on the If everybody can turn to mute, that mute, that would be great. Perfect, thank you. So, so this traumatic technical errors and biologic failures and considerations are extremely important. So, the first thing I try to get to is clinically. Why is the patient in my office? Is it instability, pain, or is it potentially instability from the pain or both? And so I think this is such an important factor to look into when evaluating what needs to be done for an ACL reconstruction. So instability itself is the best indication for revision ACL surgery. Um, for operating on people for pain is a bad actor and can have satis uh, and it can be very difficult to achieve satisfactory results. So really need to understand the etiology of the pain. Is it arthrofibrosis? Is it inadequate rehab, as I talked about before? Is it cartilage damage, meniscus insufficiency, or arthrofibrosis? And so all these can be important components to rule out because every single ACL graft that fails doesn't necessarily always need surgery. And if you operate on somebody for pain from another reason, then you might not actually address the reason why they're having the pain. The Mars group back in fact found out that 90% of patients have meniscus or cartilage damage. So again, when you go into a revision ACL mode, you need to consider that very likely there's gonna be other factors that need to be taken into consideration. And so often I'll get, uh, um, I'll get imaging initially, obviously, with an MRI, um, uh, excuse me, x-rays, MRI, and then subsequently I get CTs in almost all of the revision situations. And really this is, uh, first of all, x-rays to show me do I have good news or bad news. Obviously in a situation where you have multiple metal screws, you're going to have bone loss from those screws that are going to be created at the time of surgery and need to be taken into account. And so where is the hardware? Where is the tunnel placement? And how much tunnel expansion? And it's very important to note all these. In terms of the, uh, the MRIs that we get, we want to evaluate, to me, the meniscus and the cartilage damage, evaluate the other ligaments, and if there's prior meniscus repair that's been done, often I'll get an arthrogram to figure out, was it a healed meniscus or is there truly an unstable meniscus? I also use CT to determine the tunnel osteolysis and size and the location of hardware as well, as it's very important to take these into consideration. Finally, it's not always possible, especially in the U.S., but we try our hardest to get the prior operation details because uh, often the picture you see at the, uh, on x-rays and MRI might not show the entire picture. And so I like to see the operative pictures, the hardware details, and the operative report to know really what was done at the time of surgery. So once we decide that the patient does have, in fact, instability and pain associated with a ACL retear of the graft, often determine the best strategy at this time. Is it a go for one with a one stage revision or do we go for two with a two stage revision? And so it's important when looking at these factors to know what are there gonna be from the hardware related issues? Is there tunnel expansion? Typically if it's tunnel diameter less than 14 millimeters, I'm very confident of one stage reconstruction. Um, where is bone loss? Is it on the femoral tibial side? At the time of surgery, it's harder for me to account for the femoral bone loss uh, with bone grafting at the same time I do a ACL revision reconstruction than it is on the femoral side. So, um, and are there any other clinical concerns that need to be taken into account? Obviously, if in two-stage re revision, um, uh, greater than 14 millimeters, that's where I consider it, especially on the femoral side. Grafted corporation issues, incision issues, or arthrofibrosis concerns, then usually I will go for two. So in terms of a two-stage reconstruction, bone grafting is critical. And so first, I like to prepare and visualize the tunnels. And so often I use a, um, a retro cutter, and the retro cutter enables me to put my tunnel in the appropriate position, but also I have to account for the position the prior tunnel is in. And so often these situations are trying to determine, can I get the right size graft in the right size tunnel? And as you can see by the right-hand picture, is it clean or is it not clean? Because my goal is always to get it clean. One trick I do is often, especially in a retro cutter scenario, I'll pass a 3.5 shaver, which can fit through the hole, especially on the femur, and can actually further clean out the tunnel if some remaining soft tissue is there. And so this is a trick I've used. And then in terms of bone grafting, I use cancellus, autograft dowel, or allograft dowels, as well as supplement as needed biologics and autograft uh, to be able to, uh, again, um, impact uh, my bone tunnels and try to get healing within those bone tunnels. 
these are some of the dowels that I use. Um, um, they're usually obtained from the proximal femur with 10 to 18 millimeters in diameter, especially on the tibial side. I've had a lot of success bone grafting with dowels and then retro cutting through those bone dowels and then placing the graft through it uh, as well to try to, to, to take care of some of the bone loss at the same time as I do the reconstruction. If a patient hasn't had a patella tendon graft before, then often the patella, um, uh, the patella bone and the tibial tubercle bone I can use to further uh, allow for bone incorporation within those tunnels. And then as I mentioned, I can supplement with autograft, allograft, or some regenerative options as well. I typically will get a CT scan anywhere between three to six months to evaluate the incorporation. I've seen situations where bone putty's been put in the tunnels and that has not actually incorporated well. I typically use these autograft bone dowels to be able to, or excuse me, allograft bone dowels uh, to be able to form most of the incorporation of the graft, but I will sometimes use putty to fill in, um, to fill in spaces in some ways uh, to be able to, again, try to get as much bony incorporation as I can. This is the insertion technique that I typically utilize. Um, you're able to pass a wire and able to pass, use this center guide and pin with a dilator and obturator, and then you're able to tamp uh, these, uh, these dowels into position. On the tibial side, I typically don't have a problem at all. On the femoral side, depending on where the prior bone tunnels were, then sometimes this can be an issue. Uh, the biggest issue is when somebody's uh, bone to prior bone tunnel was just off. Um, when it's way off and it's especially vertical, then it makes it very easy for a revision reconstruction. But if the tunnel is just a little bit off, then sometimes you'll have, um, you'll have kind of, uh, you know, connected tunnels from the prior one and the one you create. And so sometimes that needs to, um, needs to be addressed at the time of surgery and sometimes will result in you having to do a two-stage procedure. In terms of one-stage ACL reconstruction, I like to look, as I mentioned before, why they failed. On the femoral side, my concerns are hardware removal and whether I can avoid the hardware. And is the tunnel anterior and vertical? On the tibial side, same issues with hardware. Um, and then is it anterior tunnel, medial tunnel, or posterior tunnel? So you need to evaluate this to know what is going to be your reconstruction tunnel on top of the one that was done before, which again can cause more bone loss and subsequently, subsequently have more difficult uh, um, integration of the graft into the tunnels in a revision situation. With an anterior femoral tunnel, this is the most common cause for failure of this. It's tight inflection with graft attenuation or rupture that occurs. If it's far anterior, you need to draw a separate tunnel. Um, this can be very hard to do because often you will be having tunnels that kind of merge together from the prior one. And this blended tunnel situation is I typically will re-drill and have a two incision technique, especially on the femoral side. Um, Non-aperture fixation I try to do because obviously this is a concern of having a, a uh, uh, a, a screw in this tunnel and whether the screw and bone will fail together. So I like to use that cortical fixation. And then a two-stage revision with bone graft again if you have overlapping tunnels or concern for size. In a vertical tunnel, uh, fortunately in some situations this will be, this tunnel will be out of position and you'll be able to get a tunnel in appropriate position where, without having uh, any situation of merging of those tunnels. I will typically use the two incision technique, although you can also drill a femoral, the femur from the anterior medial portal. I'm always careful for the medial femoral condyle in this situation of posterior blowout. The reason why I like the two incision technique with the uh, retro cutter is that you don't have to hyperflex the knee and you can really see where you're putting the tunnel, so it makes it uh, much better in revision situations. You will have to be thoughtful of the retro cutter that it doesn't break, um, especially if you have a prior patella tendon and you have cortical uh, bone inside the tunnel. You just need to be very thoughtful and to drill slowly uh, to make sure that you don't have any problems with the, uh, the hardware uh, drilling. On the tibial tunnel side, we want to evaluate it in the anterior, medial, or posterior graft. Again, if, as we're going to position our, uh, um, as these can be reasons for failure, and we're going to position our graft in mo hopefully a more anatomic position, you need to take this into account. Obviously, an anterior graft, you can worry about impingement and loss of extension and flexion with anterior blowout. Um, medial grafts, you can have medial tibial uh, plateau damage and loss of extension. And posterior grafts, you can have a vertical graft with graft impingement and no rotational control. So all these situations are, are, are problematic. So my management of the tibial tunnel, I, I'll typically re-drill it in optimal position. Um, I'll use divergent tunnels. Uh, if you do have this, you want to make sure to bone graft the tunnel prior, as I talked about before. Uh, you want to make sure that you don't create a bigger tunnel, but you can bone graft and then drill, um, as I mentioned before, through that prior, prior bone grafting at the same time. I typically try to compact as well. 
to make sure that my bone is compacted within that tunnel. Um, sometimes you can stack interference screws. I don't love doing this because, again, you're creating more and more bone loss, uh, possibly. So I like to refill with bone and then subsequently drill the tunnel. So, again, I'm, I'm trying my best uh, to be able to solve the prior problem of bone loss while also trying to get a graft to incorporate. And then I always use, uh, on the tibial side, in my opinion, I always use backup fixation. I usually use a, um, a swivel lock um, in the metaphyseal aspect of the tibia. Uh, because uh, the tibial side is a common uh, source for failure, especially with the cancellous nature of the bone. Um, I like to do this from a backup fixation perspective, and, and in these situations also get uh, backup cortical fixation if needed um, further, uh, even on the cortex. So from a revision ACL reconstruction uh, perspective and conclusion, uh, the most important thing to me is determining the cause of primary reconstruction failure and, and really evaluating physical therapy um, targets as a reason why it failed because if the patient does not undergo the right therapy to get back and the right mitigating factors to prevent a subsequent ACL injury then we haven't done everything we can to put them in the right situation and this is key uh, a key to successful revision you want to assess the patient's symptoms and really understand if instability is the reason why they failed um, which is uh, completely important as well sorry it just went off again let me just put it back on Finally, um, you want to you want to make sure that uh, to assess whether really does this failed reconstruction require revision, and anatomic graft placement must be a priority, and you cannot sacrifice at the time of revision. All people doing revisions need to be comfortable with one and two stage reconstructions, as well as really having um, realistic conversations with the patients about preoperative expectations, as well as. An understanding of every time I go to surgery, I indicate to the patient, if I come across something I'm not comfortable with, I might have to convert from a one to a two-stage reconstruction and being produced. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I appreciate, again, the uh, honor uh, with UAFE, uh, FA and uh, Dr. Murad and everybody else on the team to give me the opportunity to present. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Derek, for uh, your brilliant uh, presentation as usual. We are lucky now uh, that uh, Professor Kiami and uh, Paolo Lobo, both of them, they are uh, about to be ready. They had uh, a nice casual surgery. It's uh, always sometimes it's like that. We will... Uh, oh, Paolo, he's there. Yeah. Uh, oh, hi, guys. Hi, I, I, I think I talk in the, my presentation in Brasilia will be 11 p.m. I'm so sorry, so sorry. <laughs> I I was I was in this moment in right. New OR operating uh, two athletes, female athletes in ACL reconstruction. I'm so Tranquil, sorry. Tranquil. But I Tranquil, I, 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 I will try. <laughs> I will so, share my, my uh, I hope that you will Thank you. No worries. And uh, Dr. Darren, he will present you now. Are you ready, Paulo? Are you ready? Uh, yeah, I, I, you, I, you, I, you share my presentation, okay? Yes, you will, you will share your, you will, you will put your presentation from your side. Yes, that's okay. Otherwise, otherwise we can, we can give you time. We can give you time. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I, I have a, a little bit more time because my English is not too good. <laughs> tranquilo, tranquilo, <laughs> tranquilo, tranquilo. Thank you, thank you. Daniel, Daniel, please, could you, could you present, uh, Paulo? Absolutely. So it's a pleasure, uh, Dr. Lobo, to, for you to uh, join us today. And uh, he's going to be presenting about rupture of the ACL in the footballer and what he's learned from his draft experience. Um, Dr. Lobo is the director of the Department of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine um, for, um, uh, for a hospital home in Brasilia, uh, the FIFA Medical Center of Excellence there. And he's a fellow of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery and Sports Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh, where he was in 1998. And he's a member of the Brazilian Society of Orthopedics and the Brazilian Society of Knee Surgery. So, Dr. Lobo, please go ahead and present. We appreciate you being here. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Uh, uh, I will talk about my my experience in the ACL reconstruction uh, in footballers. Uh, what I learned in my grab preference. Uh, we we are we here in the. We are in Brasilia, in the home hospital. Uh, the, the, our group is the five surgeons 
and uh, you have the two annual, annual fellows. Then in your hospital, you have the, the research and teaching institute for, for, for papers, for education. Our group in the home hospital does a version that 350 ACL reconstruction per year. And the, the grant is the 80 BTB in hamstrings 20%. 18% BTB in hamstrings 20%. In the last 35 years, uh, we, we used the many graphs. The, from, from 1986 to May 2003, we used the synthetics ligaments, lead scale of Arthur League in Brazil, we Arthur League in lead scale, uh, hamstrings, patellar tendon. Ips laterals, and the good results were achieved the throat a learning curve. But since June the 2003, the 18 years, 50%, 60% of the case, we use the contralateral patellar tendon. Then the patients recover and we return faster. My practice with the graphs, the patellar tendon 99%, 50% ips lateral, 50% contralateral, and hamstrings 5%, and children with opening thighs associated with osteotomy. Quadriceps in revision cases where the two patellar tendons have already been used. In this moment, I did the, the first patient, the quadriceps tendon, because it's the revision. I use the quadriceps tendon and the osteotomy in the female athlete this morning. Facelata in cases of extraticular tenodesis. What I learned in the, the 35 years on the ACL injuries improved my, my results. The moment of the surgery, avoid operating the acute phase. Consider the contralateral knee, hyperextension, total flexion. Technical expect position of the tunnels, ethical expect no every patient needs surgery. Team is a special care, physiological care. In football, match, the knees move every eight seconds. The need for knee stability is fundamental. So, surgery becomes an absolute indication. We know that 75% are ultramatic, 25% are traumatic. In Brazil, we have the, maybe almost 800 professional football teams, and the eight football teams just in the first, second, third, and the fourth division. The measure of Brazilian knee surgeon use different surgical techniques, techniques, different rehabilitation protocols, different time frames for return to field. The sports media only publish news of the athletes that return, but forget the many that wait a year or more for recovery or never fully recover. My patellar why the patellar tendon graft? Because it's strong graft, bone to bone healing, high success rate, allows for unrestricted rehabilitation and early return to sports, and full regeneration. I have done the femoral tune by Media Portal since 1998. The focus of the most students for ACL reconstructions is on surgical technique, surgical instrumentation, fixation methods, graft tension, municipal repair techniques, devices, articular cartilage repair methods. But rehabilitation is an afterthought on that has been left to the physical therapist to figure out. Rehabilitation is most effective when it is integrated into the physician's practice. As physicians, not as knee surgeons, we must be 
in the charge of the rehabilitation process before and after the surgery. ACL reconstruction is not just a surgery, but an overall process with goals to be accomplished. Require cooperation between MD, PTs, patients, and family. Rehab before and after surgery is the key to a long-term success full results. Goals of the surgery, symmetry between knees is necessary for athletes the function and high level. Symmetry is also necessary for all patients to be able to do normal everyday activities comfortable. Stairs, squares. We have many physical therapists work with us on this protocol to coordinate care before and after surgery. We, we will not do surgery until the PT say the patient is physical and mentally ready for surgery. Is this, I learned ever all this uh, the, by Shelburne protocol. There is no reason to do surgery on the acutely inflamed knee. ACL surgery is never an emergency. Regain the completely normal room before the surgery allows you to regain room easily post-op. Involves regain both room and strength after the surgery. Years of observation use the Shelburne's protocol have shown us that these goals may be difficult for some patients. The strength involves rehabilitation of the graft donor side. With the PTG, we have not always understood the importance of the donor site rehabilitation. The donor site rehabilitation requires different emphasis than rehabilitation of the ACL graft itself. The problem has been that these two different rehabilitation programs are complete. This is the reason we chose the contralateral graft. Until this moment, I have operated on almost 1,000 cases by contralateral graft. Our entire group, almost 1,400 cases. We use the case tape of the events of the protocol the shower. And it is very important because we pose up full on and no swelling and increase leg strength. If very difficult. You, you do the, the two tops and the hips lateral. When you use the contralateral, it's very easy for re, uh, return, for proprioception and agility drills, sport-specific drills and competition. The ACL knee, knee prevent control and retros, return full on, provide appropriate stress to stimulate the graph to mature. The donor need, need, need regain strength on rehabilitation concern. This is conflicting goals. If you try to do aggressive strength immediately after the ACL reconstruction, reconstruction, the knee will be become swollen, stiff and painful. It is the best to wait until full wrong has been obtained before the patient begins aggressive strength. By using the contralateral graph in this protocol, we avoid these problems. Therefore, the patients recover first. Regardless of the graph search, proper and complete pre-op and post-op rehabilitation is necessary. Patients must go through a progress of steps to achieve optimal results. Full symmetrical run is required to obtain the best long-term results. Obtaining the full symmetric run, recovery strength and function is easy. Therefore, the return to sports is faster. We use the same protocol for all athletes, professional, amateur, recreational. Of course, professionals are operating two to six weeks because they have more time for good pre-operative rehabilitation. They proceed. We make the femoral tuning to the medial portal, we achieve the more anatomical position. Tendon 
impaired tendon suture is placing bone graft in the patella defect. Else, accelerate rehabilitation for donocyte. Bone graft harvest by the drill you use it for the patella defect. We use the BTB in the bottom. Uh, when you use the BTB, we, we achieve the good cortical fixation without the need for intra screws. By making the tunnels separate, we avoid the graft verticalization. The correct fibula is very, very important to make the sure the end of the bottle is in the cortical of the femur. Usually, we fixate in 20 degrees of flexion, but where we observe recovated, we fixate the graft with the knee extension. BTD fixation in tibia with the interference screw to turn absorber. We have another, an, uh, another option. When you, the, the, we use the washing button with the incision in the distal third of the tie in case of very long grafts. It depends on the size of the graft. Is the, the washer bottom is a good fixation, a good device for fixation when the, the, the graft is too long. Look, fixation of the tibia is, is done with washer bottom when the graft is shorter and the bone block is inside the tube. Message, the surgeon must know to perform at least two types of graft fixation. It is possible that you need this in case of the difficult. We avoid interosseous implants in the femur because this is made because cause difficulty in revision. Cortical fixation in the bottle or washer bottle in the femur and interference screw or washer bottle in the tibia, in my experience, have provided to be safe and effective. Sometimes we do selective reconstruction, but this this is our very cases, done only when we see anterior medial band rupture with intact postlateral band. This is immediate post-op. If lateral, the, the, the patient in the left, uh, look, the full extension, like the uh, other knee, is the key. Flexion must be perceived with CPM or tower. And the, the patient of the, the right side, uh, the contralateral, we can use the CPM or tower for exercise. And the ACL knee use the rest and the ice. 15 days, take out stitches, clinical exam, x-ray, and hydrotherapy and kinetic exercise. Step box, higher level on if the patient use the proper technique. This female athlete is a football athlete, is a four months contralateral ACL. We look like, like the left right side of the donor knee and the ACL knee exercise. Here we look the the professional futsal athlete in the four months, the functional train. If the patients normally, when you use the ipsilateral uh, graft, sometimes the patient in the five, six months uh, uh, has, has atrophy, the muscles atrophy yet. Then it's impossible to, to, to make the functional train in the four months, five months for ipsilateral. It's not too good. But when you use the contralateral, you have the good muscles, you have the good, uh, no atrophic muscles, then the functional training is more easy. These three professional athletes were operated on the same day and in these images are 
four months after surgery. Look, and the, the, the left patients have contralateral good quadrations. The patients of the center and the ipsilateral in the front man, you have the, the atrophy, the quadrus atrophy. This is right side, is the patient, the contralateral, have the good quadrices control. I learned in this, this 35 years that to have a good result in ACL reconstruction, you should remember six principles. Preoperative rehabilitation, patient preparation, perfect tunnels, perfect tunnels, perfect tunnels, good graft fixation, good post-operative rehabilitation with proprioception training. What do we what do we expect from athletes as a reward of for all of this effort? Tears of happiness over the decisive goal in the first post game. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I'm so sorry, but... <laughs> well, thank, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lobo. We really, really appreciate it. Um, I, I want to point out one uh, fact uh, with some of the changes in the speakers. I forgot to mention that uh, we wanted to thank the Cougat Institute and Dr. Uh, Edward uh, Alentorn to be available with us today. Uh, because Dr. Pugat had an emergency surgery. Um, uh, very appreciative of Dr. Alan Torn being here, and he's going to be, a, be in the moderating session as well to be able to be part of answering questions. So thank you, Dr. Alan Torn. Appreciate it. Um, next, we're going, to, uh, we're going to basically move on. Uh, Dr. Kiami, is he here with us now? Yes, I'm here. Do you, can you hear me? I can, I can hear you, yes. so we're excited to have you. Um, he is going to be giving us a lecture on ACL and ALL reconstruction with the iliotibial band. Uh, Dr. Kiami is the professor of orthopedic at La Sorbonne University in Paris, France, and he's the head of sports surgery um, at the same university. He's a consultant for sports surgery for Paris Saint Germain FC and the French Football Federation and the French Professional Football League. Um, in addition, he's the president of the Sports Medicine Diploma of Le Sabourne's University. So we really, really appreciate Dr. Kiami being available with us to give this great lecture today. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. So uh, I, I really, did, uh, it's, a, it's a pity for me to, to, be, to be late, and, uh, uh, but fortunately I'm here now. So uh, I just want to... I, we, we cannot see your screen, Fred. So I will try to share my screen. Yes. Can you see it here or not? Not yet. Ay, ay, ay. <rire> en principe, tu fais partager, euh, ouvrir le bac de partage. Oui. Si, sinon, otherwise, you can send it by email, and Dr. Mohammed he will uh, do it for you. Go ahead, like last time, exactly, and you can represent it. Aïe, aïe, aïe. It was represented from a while. We can, uh, friend, we can, uh, I can suggest something, uh, Daryl, uh, we can answer quickly one question to give time to Professor Kiami to send his uh, presentation, then uh, Mohammed, he will do he for him. Yes, it's... Sorry? He can do the what same... What do you suggest, Mohammed? He can do the same steps, it was represented from our way. Ah. I can't share my, my screen, it's a pity because uh, everything, everything is always like that, like this, uh, everything is ready and at, at the, 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 the moment you want to share, it's not possible. So share it with us and we will present it from here. 
Okay, send it. Send it by email your presentation, Fred. Okay. Send it by email, and uh, then we will have maybe we'll pick up one question, uh, Daryl, uh, to give a few minutes to uh, Frederick Yami to be ready. Do, or do we have uh, questions in a chat? I have many questions here. Okay. I have. Uh, I will. I will. Ah, ah, it's Patrick. I saw that. I thought that is Frederick. <laughs> yeah. The first question, maybe for. Uh, I have a good question for uh, Doctor. Kugat. Uh, many people they ask uh, for the uh, PRP indication. It is uh, is it uh, is it uh, immediately after surgery? So, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks a lot for the invitation. So, uh, PRP is a treatment that we offer. Yeah. So. It's a treatment that we offer um, just to improve the biological environment, and we try to achieve this by doing a first a dose at the moment of surgery. So after we are done with surgery, we put the the the, the PRP uh, intraarticularly, and sometimes also in this in the skin incision, so with the graft donor side, and then we try we typically do two other doses two weeks apart, so to complete three doses. That's the typical thing we do. We don't do it in all cases, in 100% of the cases, but but sometimes um, uh, we, we we try to do in especially if we have a professional soccer player. That that's one of our indications because we want uh, you know uh, the biological environment to be as good as possible. That's why we do in everyone in these professional ones. Was this the question? Did I answer it? Dr. Said Al Thani, would you like to add something? Uh, can you repeat the question, please? The question is the use of the PRP uh, during the ACL reconstruction. Well, uh, I'm not using PRP during the reconstruction. I use PRP if you have uh, tendonitis, especially with PTD. Sometimes you can get tendonitis during the recovery. And in that case, I will prescribe the PRP based on the Okay. Dr. Daryl? Yes, sir. Dr. Daryl, could you notice that uh, the presentation of uh, Professor Kiami is there? I can see it. Yeah. So it's okay, you can hear me? The presentation is okay? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, so yes. Sorry, but this is technique uh, consideration, but now it's okay. Um, just go okay. to full screen, Fred. Just go to full screen, please. It's not full screen, actually. Not full screen. For me, it's a full screen. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. It's please. okay. So, so uh, uh, I will uh, share my experience about uh, anterolateral ligament and AC reconstruction with idiotibial pain. So, uh, at the beginning of my story, I was trained to arthroscopy, mini-invasive surgery, and uh, I started my uh, career in PT Salpetriere Hospital in 2003. So, uh, at the beginning, it was very amazing because I had very good results with this mini-invasive technique, but with uh, low sports level patients. And, uh, you know, when uh, you are young, uh, you have only uh, low sports level patient and progressively in time 
you uh, improve uh, uh, the, the, the different patient, the level of the different patient. So progressively in time... Can, can you go for the next slide, uh, Frederick, please? Can you go for the next slide? You can see it? Actually, you can see it? We see. But, no, only, only the first slide. Now it's okay, yes. Yes, you have. Uh, you you see the the picture. Uh, yes. It's okay. Yes, great. Yes. So uh, progressively in time, uh, I notice that with this technique, I have twenty to thirty percent failure, uh, and especially for high level patients, and especially with pivot shift control patients. So. For me, uh, it was a big trouble, big problem, because a lot of doctors refer to me high-level patients. So uh, I uh, asked my colleague, because I was young, and one of my colleagues told me, you know, in our unit, we have a plasti, a specific plasti for revision cases, and you can try to use it. So uh, I asked for publication, and there were no publications on this technique. And this technique was the iliotibial band ligamentoplasty. So I entered the, the, the theater and uh, I had a big shock when I discovered uh, this technique. It was a very old technique, with, uh, come from Macintosh. Go to the next slide, please, Frederick. Go to the next slide. It's on, on my screen. It's the, the first one on my screen. No, we are we are in the second one now. Yeah, now it's okay. Yes. Okay, I will try because uh, okay. So uh, I uh, so it was a big shock when I I entered the theater and I saw uh, this uh, this technique was very uh, aggressive, uh, lot, a very long scare, uh, and for me it was the mini invasive surgeon. It was difficult to uh, admit that uh, I, I can use and perform this kind of technique. But you have to be open mind. And I asked the concept. Uh, the concept was very interesting because it was an intra and extra articular reconstruction with only the iliotibial band. So you save the extensor system, you save the flexor system, and you have only uh, one fixation uh, in the tibia. So the concept was very interesting, and uh, I tried to uh, start this kind of surgery at the beginning of my career. It was a big shock when uh, I analyzed the results, the results of this uh, ligamentoplasty, because I use it uh, for revision cases at the beginning, and my result was better in revision cases with the biotibial band than primary surgery with hamstring technique. So I was really confused, but uh, I decided to start using this ligamentoplasty with a iotibial band for primary ACL uh, rupture. Okay. It's okay. You can, you can follow? It's okay? Yes. So uh, we... Because there were no publication of this technique, I wanted to evaluate the result. Uh, so I proposed 16 experts still in France to make a comparison between hamstring, BPTD, so metandinosus 4, and iliotibial band. And it was a multicentric French study in 2012. And the result was very interesting for the iliotibial band especially on the return to sport. And we noticed that uh, for the return to sport, the return to sport of the same level, the psychologic scale, and the time frame to return to sport, uh, iliotibial band was better than all the other techniques, but not significantly. We, all, we uh, have only uh, 300 patients, and um, but it was not statistically significantly, but you can see on the slide that then the result was uh, very interesting. On this work, it was the beginning of the story, we had two conclusions. Two conclusions, first, idiotibial band technique needed scientific proof because there were no publication. And the second conclusion was that 
The results confirmed that the surgery is not whole, and we needed a more precise post-operative program because, you know, you can see on the slide that the return to sport of the same level was very, very poor in 2012. So, for the scientific proof, we uh, had some uh, uh, interrogation. We wanted to know if the resistance of the idiotibial band was enough to make reconstruction of the ACL, and we have many publications of the biomechanical data of the resistance of the idiotibial band, which is acceptable for ACL reconstruction. The, the second uh, uh, point is that, at the beginning for me, it's not possible to uh, make this kind of uh, approach too, too large. Uh, the, the incision was very, very huge. Uh, the soft tissue was damaged. So I proposed to evaluate progressively to mini-invasive technique. And actually, uh, we performed an incision 6 to 8 millimeters uh, with a single incision. Uh, you can see on this guy, it's six, six millimeters and uh, six centimeters, excuse me. So it's enough. The evolution to mini invasive technique is okay now. We published the operative technique because there were no publication, and actually, we have more and more publication of this technique with growing up. You, I, I told you at the beginning that I used to perform the surgery for revision cases. So we make analysis uh, of functional results for revision cases, especially on the return to sport after, after a second ligamentoplasty. And the results for return to sport after revision cases were not so bad. You can see here the, the study. And uh, the return to sport rate was uh, 73%, at the same level only in 42%, but quite better than some uh, different uh, study. So we, we were uh, uh, very interesting in this uh, kind of results for revision ACL reconstruction. It's not so bad, not so bad. Concerning the scientific proof, you know that everybody know actually the anterolateral ligament was uh, well precise by uh, a class in uh, 2013. And you know this anterolateral ligament come from the lateral uh, femoral epicondyle to the middle part between the head of the fibula and the jardis tubercule, the insertion is here. This is the anatomic insertion of the anterolateral ligament. And actually, many, many authors uh, prove that this ligament have uh, a role in the control of rotatory stability. So, when you want to uh, make reconstruction of the anterolateral ligament, you have two options. You can make your anatomic reconstruction from the epicondyle and the anatomic insertion on the tibia. Or you have a second option to make a lateral tenodesis. This is functional lateral tenodesis, not anatomical. And you put the insertion on the Jardic tubercle. So you have a recent uh, publication from Andrew Amis who compared these two types of reconstruction and found that the functional uh, reconstruction is uh, uh, better for uh, rotatory instability control than the anatomic reconstruction. And in our technique, in iliotibial band reconstruction, we uh, use the lateral tenodesis with this kind of reconstruction. So this is functional reconstruction and not anatomy. So we went to the cadaver lab uh, and uh, we tried to make a biomechanical try uh, to verify if we had the possibility to find the isometric point on the femur. So, the isometric point on the femur uh, does not exist. It's not possible to find it because uh, it's not unique, there, uh, but there is many, many points who are um, isometric, but in our study, we found that the good insertion for the isometric point on the femur is in the posterior 
part of the uh, lateral condyle of the femur. So there is an immediate uh, application uh, in surgery. Uh, actually, to find the isometric point, we find the Jardy tubercle here on the video. We insert a wire on the Jardy's tubercle and with the suture, this suture is exactly the same than the lateral tenodesis. So after, we tight the suture and we try to find the best point who will be uh, isometric and the suture must be tied from the flexion to the extension and if it's the case, the lateral tenodesis will be functional and will, will be perfect. So this is the direct application of the cadaver lamp to the theater. And you can see that on uh, this picture, uh, the theoretical uh, isometric point on the femur exactly the same on the postoperative X-ray. <coughs> the result of uh, this uh, pivot shift control is very interesting. You can see that it's excellent EKDC A and B in 94%, so it's very interesting. Uh, this technique controls very correctly the pivot shift um, problem. The second conclusion of the multicentric French study uh, was that we needed a more precise postoperative program, and I totally agree with Paolo Lobo when he says that everything begins before the surgery. Before the surgery, you have to prepare correctly the patient, and uh, we are not in a hurry. We have to prepare the patient correctly. Here, you have a good flexion, but you have a lack of extension. So we prepare correctly the patient. Uh, we perform isokinetic tests to reinforce the muscle before the surgery uh, to have a good uh, recovery and fast recovery after the surgery. So after the surgery, you can uh, you have to manage carefully the patient uh, with electrostimulation, passive uh, uh, mobilization, and we have to try only uh, to the swelling, the pain and the muscle stimulation to have a normal work after, after C tweets. Progressively, we build uh, early muscle monitoring with uh, isokinetic tests, as you can perform uh, by yourself, and uh, we only work on the muscle full range of motion and muscle close chain. And progressively, we introduce uh, proprioceptive monitoring very simple and uh, very small proprioceptive uh, uh, exercise, and we work on the psychologic uh, problem. And progressively, we increase the we increase the the stress on the knee, and we work on the speed court without the ball. And progressively, we introduce the ball to build a good neuromuscular monitoring. So. With the uh, iliotibial band, we were surprised that, that our patient had a very, very fast recovery. And we wanted to verify if uh, the key point um, was uh, uh, from the muscle or not. So we made an evaluation with the isokinetic test at six months after the surgery. And the result in our series, six months after the, the, the surgery, was not so bad. And, and uh, strength for extension and strength for flexion was very, very interesting and probably one of the best published in the literature. So, when we analyze the result of return to play five years after, the, after this follow-up program, you can see that we improve points, uh, we have a huge improvement uh, of the return to sport uh, according to the preoperative level uh, of the, the people. So you can see that the elites have a very, very uh, important rate to return to sport in comparison with the leisure sports guy, but the global return to sport is uh, very interesting in, in this technique. <coughs> so this is the technique I perform actually in my theater. You make an approach 
lateral approach with a single incision. You can see that it's uh, eight centimeters. So carefully, you can isolate the iliotibial band, and you can harvest a three centimeters large of the iliotibial band. You let it with this natural fixation on the Gerdy tubercule, and the band becomes a tube. So you put the suture. After you close the iliotibial band, because it's not interesting to let it open, and after it's exactly the same than you perform in your theater. So this is arthroscopy. We perform exactly the same position of the tunnel, and I agree, Paolo Lobo, the tunnel, the tunnel, the tunnel. This is the tibial tunnel, exactly the same with BPTB, with hamstring, semitendosis 4, exactly the same position of the tunnel, and with the specific outside-inside guide, you can localize precisely the isometric point on the lateral femur, you insert the wire, and inside the knee, you can insert the wire exactly on the good footprint you want. So you can drill the femoral tunnel, and after you feel the ligament inside the femur, then the joint, then the tibia. And one of, one of the advantages of this technique is that it's very economic, because uh, Concerning the fixation, you can fix with only one screw, so it's very economic. So, our indications actually is high level for this technique, is a high demanding technique, you can, uh, you can see. So, we reserve this uh, technique for high level sports people, pivot, pivot contact sports, laxity, uh, much than uh, 10 millimeters in comparison with the other knee, uh, rotatorial, rotatorial laxity, hyperlaxity, and revision cases, and for all the other indications, we continue to use arthroscopy with hamstring and linear invasive technique. Thank you very much, and I apologize for the technique consideration. It was difficult for me to connect correctly. Thank you, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Again, please. Okay. Yes, thank you, Frederick. It was a great presentation, and now just waiting. Darrell? Yes. So, yeah, please go ahead. So, we're going to go into the, the operating session, and is uh, Mubarak presenting the questions you said? Yes. Mubarak is here. Mubarak, I can uh, I can ask the first. Question. We received at least fifty-seven questions, but I know that the subject is very interesting, and we have only a few minutes more to discuss. And, uh, Patrick, he will uh, leave us now within a few minutes. I would uh, I would ask the uh, first question maybe. Uh, Uh, active sports athlete, age and gender graph consideration. So I, I can, um, or Patrick, if, if you have to leave, why don't you go ahead and uh, give your thoughts first? Yes. yes. Well, well, essentially, um, I do not have specific um, um, preference regarding whether he is a elite, he or she is a elite effect or not, right? But, it, uh, but um, for some of the patients, right, um, if they have like um, ligamental laxity, generalized ligamental laxity, which is not uncommon in Asians, especially among the Chinese, right, so we will restrict it from uh, using hamstring graft, then DDP graft is an option. Uh, in the old days, we, we did uh, prefer to have uh, BBB graft for those um, high demand elite efforts. 
But I think nowadays, uh, with all the studies and 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 um, results coming back, uh, I think both BB and hamstring graft did well uh, uh, um, uh, after good rehabilitations. Right? In um, uh, I can weigh in because uh, I didn't talk about any uh, graft selection um, choice. So in my in my opinion, uh, typically a cutting, pivoting, twisting athlete that's a high level athlete, patella tendon is my go to. If I have a pediatric patient, I'm considering IT band versus hamstring. If I have a recreational athlete, I'll typically use hamstring. And then if I have a very low demand patient, uh, especially older patient, a runner, then then typically I'll use allograft. Um, with quadriceps tendon, which we didn't talk about as much, in some cases where I'm concerned about uh, hamstring strains in some dominant sports, including soccer, where I would otherwise consider a hamstring, I am sometimes going with quadriceps. And I'm using also quadriceps in some revision situations as well. Dr. Said Al-Tani, please. Yeah, uh, 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 I think I summarized it in the end of my presentation. That for my high athletes, I will go with the with the BTB. If there is a, with the one point I haven't mentioned, if I will, uh, if I have a patient with chronic vestibulatory instability or more brilliant uh, than uh, than usual, I will go with the uh, lateral extra to the to the modified linear. And for most of the patient. Uh, None athletes, recreational sport, I will go with the hamstring. Uh, the quad tendon, I use it uh, when the, the PTB spell and when you need the three graft in certain cases. Okay, Darren, can I ask another question? Absolutely. What are technical errors, signs of ACL reconstruction during rehabilitation? Uh, so, so my practice depends upon if the rehabilitation is being is if the failure is being done initially or later. Um, obviously, it'll be very hard in the beginning to know if you had a reconstruction failure from either implant failure or graft slippage. Um, often, in a situation where you're you know, you're examining the knee, um, you want to make sure each time, if you are a physio, that you are uh, getting a sense that there is stability with a Lachman procedure. Um, you want to make sure that you're hopefully not stressing the graft during rehabilitation procedures as well. Uh, from a late perspective, it's very difficult to assess, and often, as we all know, um, ACL reconstructions can so-called loosen up. Sometimes you'll get people that are tighter on their on the side, sometimes it feels the same, and sometimes it feels slightly looser. And especially in that setting of when you're examining somebody down the road, it's very difficult to assess. Uh, so often I'll get a sense of, do I feel like they're on the looser side, and I'll correlate that with the MRI, as well as why they're presenting to me based on symptoms. But initially, it can be a little difficult to, to note, especially when they have some increased swelling if you're getting implant failure. But that's why you can use x-rays to make sure that if, it, if implants are visible, you're not. But if, uh, again, we're using bio screws, you don't necessarily see the, uh, the implants. Okay. Thank you. Do you have uh, any specific question for uh, uh, one of our friends regarding his uh, technique, same sign, or Frederick or uh, Patrick, from your side as a surgeon, you know. Well, uh, maybe I try, try to answer the, the questions that you just asked about the the, the sign of failure in rehabilitation. I I, I, I think uh, Daryl did mention quite important points of regarding um, laxity or the loosening of the knee, right? But the other extreme is too tight. Right, well, sometimes we, we think that it's not good enough. So, uh, and indeed, right, for general good orthopedic knee surgeons, I think laxity is, is seldom appears, right? Uh, if you are regularly doing a reconstruction. But on the other hand, someone is like uh, putting it too tight and then pick, 
too much tension on the knee joint, over tightening, and that creates a lot of uh, patellofemoral knee joint problem, uh, limited knee extension, and so on. So, so I think good is enough, not too tight, right? So I think um, this is the early sign of failure as well, right? And that's also lead to earlier graft rupture if the tension is too high. Okay. Thank you, Patrick, for that clarification. Uh, I think I also, uh, I think having yeah. a good rehabilitation, where you know your limit uh, as a therapist, and when it's the right time to stress the graft, uh, to stress it before the field, then you're compromising the stability of the graft itself. So I think it is communication between surgeon and rehabilitation uh, who is uh, managing the patient. Uh, you know, we have an issue here. Most of the patient doesn't go to any place. They have different school and different uh, place where they do rehabilitation. So I usually advise my patient to stick with, with certain team and we can think about the rehabilitation protocol. Yes, of course. Thank you, Saeed, for raising this very important uh, question. As you said, the uh, collaboration, the cooperation between surgeon and uh, rehabilitator is one of the main keys of the success, because uh, especially when we talk about high-level sports people, definitely, and I can include in the loop, definitely the uh, club management, the club medical staff. It's very important, So, uh, because as you said, if there is no communication, if there is no cooperation, definitely uh, the player inside or the patient at the end of the day is a patient, and uh, definitely he will not uh, uh, he will not be happy with his rehabilitation, and most probably he will face uh, hard moments and uh, maybe fail sometimes. I would love also to ask uh, Professor Kotiami regarding his technique. Because, uh, as you know, maybe you mentioned many times that uh, your technique uh, is not, uh, there is no enough publications. And uh, would you like, please, to clarify more about this uh, issue? Yes, uh, thank you for this question. But this technique is a very old technique. Uh, it comes from Macintosh in 1974. So you can see that it's very old. But I think that the concept is very interesting because with only uh, one band of the iliotibial band, you can manage correctly two functions. You can control correctly the anterior draw, and you can control correctly the rotational instability with an automatic lateral telebasis. And you can sacri sacrifice only uh, uh, a two or three centimeters wide um, iliotibial band uh, that will heal correctly, uh, uh, spontaneously uh, in the in the future. So I think that this technique, the concept, is very interesting because you can you can uh, see and notice that progressively in time, the big problem in the ACL reconstruction is the control of the rotatory instability. It's not the anterior draw. The anterior draw actually is correctly uh, managed by. Uh, by uh, all the, the intra-articular ligamentoplasty. But the big problem is the rotatory instability. And in that te this technique, I think that we have the two possibilities to control, we have one possibility to control the two problems. And uh, the big problem of, of this uh, technique that, that uh, is not well uh, uh, known in, in the literature the big problem is that we have to build a reputation with publication. And this is the work I tried to start 10 years before with all the publication about this uh, uh, this technique. So uh, the surgeon don't want but, to... But, 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 sorry, sorry, Brad, you told me that uh, you faced some resistance from the, uh, basically from the American Germans. From the American? Ah, yeah. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, this is important to clarify also, as we have uh, dealt with us. Yes, because, you know, at, uh, at the beginning, when I, I tried my, my first 130 cases, it was a very, very good study, but when I submit the work on the American Journal, they told me, what, what is this technique? 
do you do you uh, talk about the Macintosh uh, 1974? It's not possible for us to publish that. It's not possible. So this is the reason why I uh, I uh, try to publish the evolution of the Macintosh facial data. I published it in 2013. And actually now it's not a problem to publish our result because the technique, the operative technique is now published. So it's very important to publish the technique because after when you want to publish the result, you need to, to make reference of uh, the original technique. But now it's not a problem because everything is published by this case. Yes, uh, well, I think that um, historically in the U.S., obviously IT band-based procedures, which were called Michele Coker procedures in the U.S., um, which are modifications of even the Macintosh, were associated with pediatric ACL reconstructions where you go over the top, uh, both the femoral side and over the top in the front under the um, intermeniscal ligament on the tibial side. And so I think probably some of the confusion initially was in, in the U.S. journals is the thought of, is that the technique? But clearly... Um, uh, Fred is using tunnels associated with it in an adult scenario. So that's that's the modification for using the graft, which is an auto autogenous graft, uh, for application from the peds world to more of an adult world to uh, to have it associated with reconstructing both the ALL as well as the ACL at the same time. So so I think honestly, uh, there's some great uh, great information there. What I always struggle with is when do we have to reconstruct the ALL? Obviously, people that, that hyperextend uh, revision situations, um, there is, as, as Patrick talked about, that too tight phenomenon. And so if you over-tighten the lateral compartment, do you, do you potentiate lateral compartment issues? Um, you know, so again, there's, you're trying to figure out when to pull out that trigger and when to tighten it up, um, especially in the setting of chronic ACL insufficiency. That's where it's really for me, because then you get the suspenders are messed up, so you need belt-end suspenders. Overall, uh, I have uh, one point to mention. You know, early in my career, I did starting work with John Cameron. John Cameron was one of the last fellows of uh, Macintosh. And uh, he would continue to do uh, Macintosh at the scene of uh, the way uh, Macintosh was doing them. Where we take it over the top and we do it kind of through the TV. And when we the major withdrawal for these patients, uh, although with a very solid, stable knee, uh, is the lateral compartment osteoarthritis and the tightening of the lateral compartment. So over the long term, we started with uh, lateral compartment uh, osteoarthritis, and uh, that was one of the main withdrawal for using this procedure also in professional areas. Not a creation. I think he was using it only for people with military and their bodyguards and stuff like that. Any comment from your side, uh, Daryl or Frederick? Patrick, I think he left already. And uh, Paolo, he returned back to his breathing room. Daryl? Sorry, I was uh, muted, but uh, but no further comments. Uh, I agree. Um, as I mentioned before, I get concerned about over constraining the lateral compartment, uh, especially if somebody's had an issue. Um, I think there is a time where ALL with an ACL is needed, and there's probably times that it's not. And I think that's what we're learning as a field. Um, we can do all the biomechanical studies we want and to show associate it with lower pivot shift rates, things like that. But Certainly, clinically, we need to continue to validate when and why to use it because more surgery is not always better surgery. So, so in my mind, I think there are spaces, the chronic ACL insufficient knee, the, um, the hyperextender, the possible revision ACL without lateral compartment issues, um, but that high-grade pivot shift setup situation in a patient. That's, that's in my practice when I pull it out. Thank you, Darren. Uh, Dr. Sai, I think uh, unless you want to add something, I think we can close. I think yes, it was a good uh, talk uh, by everybody. We enjoyed discussion and uh, learning the different experience. Uh, 
about different parts of the brain. And I think most of us agree on one thing, is uh, having a good meaning instead of me after the surgery. It doesn't matter how you do it, but if you do it, uh, if you do it, you do it right. That's what uh, I conclude from this talk. Thank you, Said. Thank you so much, Dr. Said Atani, uh, Vice President of the uh, UIA Football Association uh, Medical Committee. And by the way, we send our regards to our big brother, Dr. Mustafa Al Hashimi, the chairman of our uh, medical committee. Thank you so much for uh, accepting uh, this invitation and for your active participation as usual. Uh, I would like also to thank. Frederick Yami, Paolo Lugu, uh, Patrick Yung, and uh, Mubarak al -Mutawa. And uh, Daryl, would you like to close, please? No, thank you so much. Uh, obviously, as always, in this virtual meeting space, we have some challenges uh, amongst all of us to figure out how to wage war. The good part is none of us are, are information and technology specialists. We're orthopedic surgeons. So uh, as long as we're doing the right thing in the operating room, we're doing well. I think ACL is a fantastic topic. Um, I just counsel everybody, in my opinion, we need to look at techniques, but we also need to look at the rehab side. And, and I, would, I would continue to maintain that everybody needs to keep a, a close focus on how to rehabilitate to, to avoid revision situations. But I thank, um, I thank the UAFA, uh, as well as uh, Dr. Murad and the, uh, the, the uh, Center of Excellence, FIFA Center of Excellence in Dubai for helping us stir the debate amongst colleagues uh, as this is a great time to be able to continue to push forward the science of what we're doing. Thank you, thank you, Darren. And sorry, I forgot to mention our big friend, uh, to thank him a lot, uh, Ramon Kogat, all his team and lovely Dr. Edward Allenton for his time to be with us today. Thank you all of you and see you thank very you. soon. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye -bye.